I want to just jump right in. We're going to hear from Tatiana and from Brendan Foley. Tatiana, I think, represents the new world of all things digital, all things three-dimensional, as applied to really interesting domains like exploration and field projects. Some of these technologies that would enable people like Brendan Foley to do the truly innovative things they're doing. And Brendan's going to tell us all about what new discoveries await on Antikythera. So without further ado, Tatiana. Tatiana Zambazova. Good afternoon. So you heard some really inspiring things this morning, and it was about the past and about technology. And I will do the opposite. I'll talk about technology and about the future. So um, I come from the world of design technology. I work in Autodesk, and we make tools that help architects, engineers, filmmakers, bridge makers, product makers to pretty much imagine, design, and create the world around us. And when I say design, I mean they not only design, but they can analyze and simulate and fabricate buildings, bridges, cars, just imagine it. But there is something tricky about our software, and it is that every single software we make starts like this. It starts with an empty screen. Well, that's not only intimidating, but it's also illogical because if you think about it, when an architect makes a building, well, it's next to some other building or on the street. But that street, that building is missing in the computer. When somebody designs a custom prosthetic, well, the arm is missing. Uh, when, when an interior architect designs an interior, uh, the building is missing. So for the longest of times, bringing the real, the analog world around us in the computer so that we can do something with it, about it, off it, around it, has been a real challenge. So thus, something as simple as, hey, I'm redesigning my kitchen, can be a huge problem if your building is old or the house is old and all the walls are kind of, you know, in all directions, and then you have to measure and nothing fits and nothing matches. Imagine the... Uh, the job of uh, the architects Odil Deck, who were designing the super cool restaurant in the uh, Opera Garnier in Paris. If you see, it's, uh, you know, you start from scratch and you have all of those curves around you. And then imagine if you're somebody who is an engineer of a water pipeline and they have to do that in this environment and they start from scratch. So, real challenge. Well, we're lucky that about 10 years ago, laser scanners were invented. They were pretty much the first devices that allowed us to capture the world around us and bring it in a computer. Laser scanner can be on a tripod or on a drone or on a copter. What it does is it shoots laser beams in space, it rotates slightly when it does that, and it hits the first surface it finds, captures the information about those points on the surface, sends that back to the computer. And what it sends to the computer used to look like this until very recently. It's a swarm of points that know their location in space. So, it looks 3D, it's not really 3D, but hey, we brought the real world in the computer. It's already something great. Well, a lot has happened in the last couple of years. From expensive laser scanners that used to cost a quarter of a million dollars and only accessible to academia or to rich people or big companies, we now have amazing array of new types of sensoring and capture devices. We're talking about structured light scanner, blue light scanner, white light scanner, arm scanners, and then we have new types of devices like Kinect or the, the amazing Google Tango. All of these sensors have become ubiquitous. They're cheap, they're accessible, and many of them are on the devices that you carry in your pocket and you don't even know. So, um, just capturing the world and digitizing it is not enough because it, you have to make the data that you digitize useful. The data is huge. Many software will crash just opening it. And it's useless if you don't do something smart to it. So from something that used to look like a black and white point cloud that was sparse, now scans use, uh, look, look like this. Basically, this is now a scan. It pretty much looks like the real world. Why is this important? Because now, as an architect, and I was an architect for 14 years, instead of rebuilding the building in which I just do interior, I'm just going to scan it and then put it in Revit, which is an architectural software, and I'm going to focus on the task at hand, which is designing the new stuff, but don't bother about designing the old stuff because that already exists. And this is scalable. This can be applied to a building, to a bridge, to a street, to an entire city. But where we want to push the technology is not just 
to visualize beautifully what we captured. This is, by the way, San Francisco captured, and it just goes on and on, and it's now on the computer. But we want to make this data smart, so that, for example, when we capture this factory, hey, that looks like a pipe, right? It's a bunch of points, it's not a pipe. But it's not a reason not to know that actually that pipe has a diameter. So we call this working directly with the reality without needing to recreate it. Now, laser scanners have become cheaper, have become easier to use, um, are more affordable, etc. But there's still not something that any one of you can do or any one of you can, can get, not many. There is another method of capturing or digitizing the world, and that is the world of photogrammetry. But before that, I forgot that I have this video as well. Um, it's not only about designing new stuff, be it cities, bridges, or buildings. I'm personally much more interested in how can we capture our heritage. Because as you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, acidic rains, terrorist attacks, we are losing our heritage. In the morning, we, talked, we heard about that. And this is really, really uh, very painful to watch, especially what was happening in the last couple of months with ISIS and the Middle East. So imagine that we can today capture everything that we have. So at least we have a digital archive of, of the beautiful things from the past. And then when we have money, we can reconstruct it or re renovate it, or sometimes go there without really having gone there. But I said there is a better or better, easier and cheaper and more accessible way to digitize the reality. And that is what's called photogrammetry or image-based modeling. For that, you just need a photo camera, a camera that you have in your phone or a little bit some of the fancier cameras. And all you need to do is take pictures, if it's an object, around the object, and you just get a 3D model. Done like that, magic. And it really is magic. So let's look at some examples. This is a little... Um, kind of church building in uh, Sonoma. Uh, we took about 50, 60 images, photos, and that's what we got, automatically generated by the software. You didn't need to do anything. Um, the next example is a dragon panel. Uh, this is in Singapore. I was there. It was under a roof of a Chinese temple, and I really loved it. And it was too high, so I put the camera on a monopod, and I was clicking, clicking, clicking. About 35 photos, I got a 3D model of that um, panel. But this example is probably the nicest one. So you will see about 70 photos. I was at a dinner table at a friend of mine and just took pictures of this Krishna statue, um, uploaded it in the software that I'm uh, creating, and this is what I got. Now, for those of you who understand 3D modeling in computer, you know that you can model this. But first of all, you really need to know well how to model. Secondly, it will take you at least a month to really do this intricacy. And lastly, it will never be really a digital replica of that object. It will be an interpretation. This is a real digital replica of an object of the past. And this goes in many different scales. Um, we are now testing with macro photography and insects. With Giga Macro, who is making an uh, automated uh, rig of uh, macro photography, we're trying to see can we digitize all the insects in the world and see them really big and uh, print them, etc. Now, what I love about photogrammetry is that it doesn't only let us digitize the world that exists, but also the world that is gone. Now you will say, what is she talking about? Well, if you remember in 2001, um, oh, sorry. Um, first, let me show you how this works. You take a bunch of photos, you load them in the software. This is the software that I'm making. It's called Memento. And all you need to do is give a name to the project. It shoots it to the cloud, and what comes back is a 3D model. It might be dirty because the photos took the environment. You will find a super easy Photoshop-like editing of the models, and that's pretty much it. So why is this important? Um, we, want, we saw that uh, with these reality solutions, there's so many new uh, interesting use cases um, for different types of professionals who are not necessarily engineers, they're not 3D geeks, they don't understand technology, but they want to leverage them. And we decided to make products that will really leverage this hardware democratization of the sensors and make software that anybody can understand so they can digitize. So with those... 50 photos. This was my very first reconstruction I ever did in my life. Uh, I did this uh, uh, bicephalus horse, and then I could just as well 3D print because um, I got a 3D beautiful high precision model from the uh, photos. In 2001, um, Taliban bombed the famous Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan. 
they were carved in stone on a cliff. They were amazing. And the world was really sad because all there was left is this. This is what we have there now. And there was no document of this. Well, we're wrong. There actually is a document. And who made it? Any one of us who has ever gone there as a tourist and took a bunch of photos and was kind enough to put them on Flickr or on Facebook, etc. We went, searched for photos, found them down. Of course, we a little bit selected which photos to use, but we were able to reconstruct in 3D something that does not exist anymore. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should do this in the future, but capture the world. There are crazy people around us, there are earthquakes, there are tsunamis, if we capture the world, if we use these technologies, we will at least be able to show the future generations what we have. So what with all this? We have amazing hardware that is now cheap and easy to use. Uh, we have super software that makes it easy. What with it? Well, um, I was interested to see what with it outside of the usual world of architects and engineers, etc. And last, in the last two years, I worked with some amazing professionals who are pushing their professions to the limits using this technology. And I would like to tell you their stories. The first one is the story of Sly Lee, a young marine scientist from the Hydras. He is researching corals. And as you know, corals are having biodiversity almost as equal as the rainforest, super rich. And they save us from tsunamis and uh, hurricanes, etc. But in spite of the importance of the corals, there is the research level, the scientific research level of um, is the coral healthy or not, what's going on, is not very sophisticated. And he was amazed to see that there was no reliable way to measure a coral. Is it growing or shrinking? As simple as that. So he learned about our technology. And um, he set shop. This is his shop. And he bought an underwater camera. And this is what he does. He takes photos just the, the same way I was explaining to you. It can be me holding the camera, it can be underwater, it can be on a drone. And he takes series of pictures of entire coral reefs. So his idea is that, this is a shot of the video that he captures, this is already in the software. This is already a 3D digital model of what he captured. So why is he doing this? With this first, he digitizes um, the coral. And then he wants to go there six months later on the same spot, digitize again, and then in our software compare and see is the coral shrinking or growing. He is also creating a beautiful 3D digital library of all of these corals that he can measure either digitally or um, he can um, 3D print and uh, explore and educate with. And thanks to him, when we were developing the software, we made that feature for comparison. So he loads now one model taken, let's say, in January, and one model in June, and the software will display the difference between the two models and understand what's going on. This is a 3D print of one of the corals. He is also sharing unselfishly everything that he does online, including the models. So people like me who are super scared of diving and sharks um, can see them and enjoy them and appreciate them and maybe think about what we're doing to the ocean. Um, so I'm curious if this is a new form of scientific research empowered by technology, because it was not uh, a technique that anybody used before. The next story is about the famous Leakey family. For those of you who have not heard of them, there are three generations of um, fossil hunters who in six decades have been operating in Kenya and Tanzania and uh, writing really the story of the human origin. And they have uncovered thousands and thousands of fossils of uh, hominids and uh, um, animals and the first tools. And uh, sadly for them, all of that today is in the Museum of Nairobi, where not many people go. So scientists who want to explore that have to go to Kenya. Um, teachers who want to teach with it do not have access to this material. But the motto of the Leakey family was always to share with the world what they have found, not just in academic papers. So the third generation, Louis Leakey, uh, came to TED to talk. And there we had a booth, a photo booth, in which a person sits and cameras are capturing the person and the person is in 3D. And she said, oh, I know a far better use of this technology. So um, she basically learned how to do photogrammetry. And from very, very modest efforts of her literally alone trying to figure it out, today she has 
um, she's posting at least 50 models every month, new and new fossils in 3D on the web. And we helped her and we continue, uh, continue to help her make actually a website that instead of the static traditional websites where you go, you read, you see images, it's boring. Now you have an um, interactive website where an educator or a science aficionado, anybody can just go, um, pick a uh, any of the skulls, any of the uh, mandibles uh, or the tools, learn from text, learn from map. We're adding, Louise also talking over, you can, if you're a scientist, you can uh, research the scientific number or name of the fossil. And then there are tools to, um, you know, you can zoom in and see really in detail. But of course, uh, we also can compare. So this is the modern human, it has a bigger skull bigger brain, but are we smarter than K-N-M-E-R 406? We don't know. Um, what is beautiful about what Louise is doing is that she allows anyone to download the 3D models so that, to be or not to be, um, at school, uh, the teachers can actually teach by printing, even on smaller maker bots or smaller printers, um, the actual skulls so that uh, students, instead of learning from books, they can actually compare the 3D prints and say, oh, wow, his head was flat or this guy's head was, and really learn in a more interactive way. She's also allowing a downloading of cardboard patterns, which we're making with another software that uh, I worked on a couple of years ago, so that for countries that don't have um, the budgets to buy 3D printers, they make these cardboard models, but through this interactivity, they learn in a different way. So when you see this, you say, hey, is this a play or is this teaching? Is this education? Well, it's both, and that is what uh, today technology enables. The next story is um, not in Egypt. This is in Sweden. The Mediterranean Museum in Sweden has a beautiful Egyptian collection. And last year, they wanted to leverage technology to make the in-museum experience really much more exciting. So they invited us and the company called Intraspectral to do something cool. So we got Mr. Nesvayu, who was a priest. We got his body and the cartonage and the two sarcophagi. So what we did was we CAT scanned the body and then using the method of photogrammetry, we basically took photos of the cartonage and uh, uh, all the sarcophagi. So what we ended up with is a 3D digital model of the bones, flesh, hair, whatever was inside and then the first cartonage, and then the first sarcophagi, the second sarcophagi. Basically, we got a 3D digital replica of this mummy. So why was this important? What we did was, and that was basically introspectral, they put it on an interactive tablet that now lives in the museum, just in front of the glass behind which the mummy is actually there. And we can now digitally unwrap the mummy. We can go through all the layers without touching the sarcophagi. Um, uh, you can zoom in in every single pearl. If you know how to read hieroglyphs, you can read the hieroglyphs. Something that is simply impossible to do when it's dusting behind glass and you're, you know, poking and trying to see a little bit more. When we did the, uh, obviously because everything is in 3D, we could also 3D print the sarcophagus, and I'm always joking that you can then assemble them like Russian babushka dolls and play with them. <laughs> but they're awesome, they really are awesome. And um, what was interesting is that we actually found 120 hidden amulets inside the, bo the, the body under the wrappings of the mummy. And without unwrapping them, we could actually 3D print, because it was in 3D, 3D print the negative, so we made a cast, and then in bronze we recreated the amulets that were there, and we were proudly wearing them at the opening of the exhibition. I was at the opening, and I cannot tell you how heartwarming it was to watch this. Usually, when you go to a museum, the kids are dragging the parents, come on, it's boring, let's go home. Now it was the opposite. The parents were, let's go, and the kids, no, we want to stay. This was cool, because this is the way they want to learn. This is the way they want to play. They knew what to do. Nobody was showing them anything. They didn't even let anybody show them anything. And it was really a joy to see. Um, so is this uh, the end of no touch in the museums where we can actually touch and explore on our own terms and in our own way? And the last story I want to tell you is the story about the Smithsonian. As you know, it's the biggest collection of museums in the world. It has 19 museums with 137 million objects. But if you're somebody like me who loves going to museum, this is what you see, 2%. 
because they don't have enough buildings to put everything that they actually have. So there are artifacts in the archives and outside of DC and outside in um, storage rooms. So the Smithsonian wanted to solve that challenge, how to offer those who visit and those who can never come to the museums the entire collections. And they also wanted to solve another problem, meaning um, how to interest the kids of today who only wants to see at computer screens. So what they did was um, they started a project where they started um, testing all of these capturing technologies. Surfacer, micro CT scan, uh, ferrous scanners, photogrammetry, they tried everything. And they started digitizing. But then they needed a tool that will help them show the world and tell the stories in the new uh, 21st century way. And that is when they uh, approached us. And together we built something amazing that any one of you can enjoy. It's called the Smithsonian X3D. They picked 20 objects that were iconic, uh, from as small as a bead to as big as a supernova remnant, and wanted to show them in browser, in a software that doesn't require any uh, download. So any school, any aficionado, any one of you can actually uh, go and see it. So we worked on that, and uh, the first thing that was important for us was how to make the objects as beautiful in browser as they are in real life. I didn't want them to look like in Second Life. So um, it, it is a challenge to make in browser something look good. But this story is amazing. This was a cosmic Buddha with a very shallow relief. And the curator could not read the story of the Buddha uh, that was written on the relief because it was all damaged. And we just showed him this, that he could deepen the relief once it was digitized. And the same curator who just an hour before that told me, oh, I don't like technology, I only use an email. Uh, he said, I'm sold. What do you want? You know, Because they saw that um, they have both ways to research in a different way, but also tell the story in a different way. So imagine you're a teacher. You teach about the mammoths. And instead of saying, open page 57, you tell the kids, open the Smithsonian 3D model of the mammoth and measure how tall was the leg, for example. And we made a couple of tools to also not be just serious and just learn, but you can make some art using these beautiful artifacts of the past. We made a bunch of tools for the scientists where they could define hot zones and hot spots, but most importantly, create tours like this without any programming or any 3D knowledge where they use artifacts of any kind, uh, PDFs, old drawings, audio, video, and combine them with this 3D world in order to tell a story about the cosmic Buddha or about something else. So, are the museums going to come to our home? Is that the future of the museums? We'll see. But all of these new ways of doing things are really thanks to the fact that hardware and software has so much improved. So for me, this concept is what I call rip, fix, burn. So you rip the reality, you fix it, mix it, change it a little bit if needed, and then you reburn it back into real life with 3D printers in another way. Or rip, fix, learn. You use it to educate, to teach. I believe that these concepts will dramatically change uh, not only the way how the scientists and um, uh, museum curators and others, but we also believe that it might change the way how products will be designed in the future. Instead of starting from scratch, you start from something and just go and improve it. But that will be another talk because this is the time that I have been given. And um, until then, uh, we will continue making tools that uh, many, many can use, that are easy to use, and uh, with that, I thank you. Well, that was all kinds of awesome. Um, you know, I used to consider myself a fairly advanced computer guy, but it's nice when I see things that blow me away, and a lot of that blew me away, and I know that Brendan and other Brendans out there are going to be able to apply this in the field in ways that... Um, really are revolutionary. And so with that, Brendan, I think it falls to you to sort of pull everything together by showing the room what new things you're going to find in Antikythera. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Well, that's a great act to follow because we're doing a lot of photogrammetry and 3D modeling of artifacts, a lot of it courtesy of Autodesk and their software. So I'm really excited to see what the future is going to hold as we start to bring up new artifacts from the Antikythera shipwreck. So we'll get right into it. 
We've been working at the Antikythera shipwreck for the last three years at the invitation of the, the government of Greece, which is a pretty unique thing. The, the Greeks typically don't let foreigners work in their waters. So I feel especially privileged that for the last oh, 10, 12 years now, every year we've been working on different shipwrecks in Greek waters. We've worked on something like 40 ancient wrecks dating as far back as the seventh century BC. Well, we're really after our wrecks that date back to the second and third millennia BC so we can get at the, the origins of civilization. But that's another story for another day. On the Antikythera shipwreck, uh, Michael did an excellent job this morning, Michael Wright, talking about that thing, which really focuses attention on this wreck and makes it stand out from anything else we've ever found on the seafloor. It's, it's a spectacular object, and Michael, you might, you might not agree with me that it's, uh, it's exquisite, it's, it's, it's so fine. Uh, there's nothing else like it. I, I think it's as, as amazing as King Tut's death mask in terms of an archaeological artifact. So with that beautiful thing, that important thing on this shipwreck, it allows us to focus attention, to bring new technology, and to develop the field of maritime archaeology in a way that it really hasn't been uh, pursued in the past. So part of that is applying new technologies. And here's one of our friends, the exosuit, which is an atmospheric diving system, which we put on the wreck this past season and uh, it allows us to make new discoveries. You see here, one of our chief divers holding the beautiful thing, I, su I suppose I should keep the, the best thing, the piste de resistance, till the end. But what you're looking at there is a new bronze statue element from the Antikythera shipwreck. It's a 2.1 meter, 10.28 kilogram bronze spear from a statue that was previously unknown. So the rest of it sits on the seafloor. So we already know a little bit about where Antikythera sits, and here it is, that little fly speck, as, as Michael Hawley said this morning. It's really sitting as the gateway between the Mediterranean and the Aegean, and up beyond the Aegean, the Black Sea. Uh, why does that matter? In the time of the, the Antikythera shipwreck in the first century BC, as Rome is burgeoning, as Rome's population is expanding, the ships that are coming out of Rome are transiting to Alexandria, uh, down, down here on the the Egyptian coast, and into the Black Sea to get grain, to make the bread that feeds the peoples. Rome ends up being the first city in the world with a population exceeding one million inhabitants. So that figures in to our story in a little while. So this is where we've been working. Uh, we call it the Rock. It's an inhospitable place. There are about 30 year-round inhabitants. There are about 400 goats, and that's it. There's no hotel, there's no restaurant. There's really no facilities or amenities at all. Have to be totally self-sustained. So the story starts in 1900 when a group of sponge fishermen from the Dodecanese Islands in the eastern part of Greece were transiting to their fishing grounds in North Africa off Tunisia. They had a man and their crew called Yorgos Kritikos, George the Cretan. Uh, and we think that he was living on the north coast of Crete, and that's why these boats transited past Antikythera instead of taking the more direct route straight across the Mediterranean. So they stopped to pick up Yorgos Kritikos. They headed over to Antikythera to go through that passage. The storm came up. They put in for a few days to wait for the storm winds to blow out. It was right around Easter, so it's possible that they were looking for some fish to eat uh, for their dinner because they wouldn't be eating meat. They went over the side, and this jerk comes on the, on the safety line, they haul up the diver, and yeah, he's raving about landing on piles of corpses. So the captain of the, of the Kaiki, here he is, uh, decides he has to go down himself and have a look. So he goes back down and he comes up holding not the limb of a corpse, but the arm of a bronze statue. So the sponge divers take a couple more days to investigate this site, and then they go on their merry way and they fish for the season. But when they come back at the end of the summer, they report back to Athens what they've found. And it's interesting because where they lived was still under the rule of the Ottomans, of the Turks. But they report back to Athens because they're good sons of Helen. They're, they're Greeks through and through. And the, the, the nascent Greek Republic then puts assets in to go down and recover these Greek antiquities. So archaeology often is political. On this shipwreck, in these waters, it's extraordinarily political. It was in 1900. It remains political today. Just a couple months ago, the president of the Hellenic Republic, which is a, an honorific position, put our project under his aegis. So we now have the imprimatur of the president of the Hellenic Republic. 
So what did they do? In 1900, 1901, they had one diving dress, one bronze helmet with boys pumping air down a, a tube. Uh, the divers would go over the side. You can see the diver, where is he? Here, there's the diver. And of course, the men in the suits, as, uh, as Professor Alexopoulos said this morning, those are the guys from Athens. Those are the lawyers and the government officials who are there to, to keep watch. So the divers shared this one suit and their total dive time was somewhere between eight and 10 minutes, of which about six or seven minutes was consumed with descent and ascent. So they had about two or three minutes on the seafloor at a depth of about 200 feet. Uh, breathing air pumped into this helmet. Nitrogen narcosis must have been extreme. Carbon dioxide buildup inside the helmet must have been extreme. It's unbelievable what they were able to achieve without any artificial light and with this primitive diving equipment. And of course, the mechanism comes up along with many, many other things. And I joked that it came with the, uh, the world's first owner's manual with the script written in the, in the bronze. Uh, I'm sure Michael won't like that I'm, I'm teasing about the, the machine. But what else came up? Well, the, the mundane stuff of, of everyday trade, the stuff that the crew on this vessel would have been eating and drinking from. So amphoras, which are sort of the 55 gallon drum of antiquity. They were used to transport anything that was liquid or semi-liquid. It's a technology that's invented by the Canaanites, yeah, those Canaanites from the Bible, around the 14th century BC. And it's a perfect technology. It's made of a material that's very, very cheap, very easy to work. So the Canaanites invent it, the Greeks make it their own. And within a few hundred years, every different Greek polis has its own style of amphora. And those styles change through time. We like to think that General Motors came up with the annual model change. Well, the ancient Greeks were there before us. So as an archeologist, these things are great because while the ceramic may be somewhat fragile, you can see the, the, the shattered jars here, the, the general shape of it can still be discerned even from the neck or the handle. So at a glance, we can tell where and when a jar dates to and therefore where the cargo comes from. So we see this all the time on many, many wrecks throughout the, the Mediterranean. But this wreck was different because it also had higher value goods like like these, uh, these jugs here, the table jugs, which would have maybe been used to carry wine, uh, who knows what else. These were not cargo, these would have been used on board. We've recovered 50 of these now between the 1900 and later 1976 when Jacques Cousteau was on the site and our most recent intervention this past year. So uh, an interesting thing, starting to show a little bit higher value cargo. And then there's the statues. So this is a life-size marble horse, one of four that were recovered well, not quite. Three were recovered. One was brought up in the sling that you see here. And as it reached the surface of the water, the sling slipped and the horse plunged back down into what they thought in 1900 was uh, an impossibly deep, a bottomless depth. Well, it's not bottomless. It's no more than 150 meters. We know because we've mapped the entire coast now. So maybe at some point we'll go out and find this fourth horse and reunite him with the rest of his team which is now on display uh, in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And here's another image <clears throat> taken by one of my personal heroes, Doc Edgerton from MIT. Doc and Jacques Cousteau after World War II partnered. And Doc went everywhere with Jacques Cousteau uh, whenever he was invited. And of course, Doc's favorite uh, or famous saying is, I'm interested in interesting things. Well, Antikythera and Jacques Cousteau's expeditions were interesting things for Doc. So, in the outside courtyard at the National Archaeological Museum in 53, Edgerton took this picture and this picture showing some of those statues that came up in the 1900-1901 recovery effort. 36 statues of marble, life-size statues from the Hellenistic world and possibly from as far back as the classical or even the archaic period back to the 6th century BC. Most of these statues were standing proud of the seafloor, so they were sitting on the mud and that's why they're so badly eroded. It must have been a beautiful statue when it was first carved of the marble from Paros, but somehow I think it's even more evocative now in its, in its sort of futuristic, uh, modernist, postmodernist look. And then others. On the left panel, it's Odysseus. On the right, it's Dionysus. And you might ask, how do we know that this is Odysseus or Dionysus? It's all so badly eroded. Well, what I've learned over the last year is that these statues were made in series. So here's a statue where the right side was down in the mud and perfectly preserved, the left side up in the water column. It's a wrestler, 
uh, about to grapple. But these things are made in series in marble and in bronze. So here are two uh, apoxiomenoi, uh, the athlete who's uh, cleaning himself with the strigil. The marble version has been reconstructed so that he's holding uh, a jar. Uh, but in the original, he would have been holding a strigil to clean himself. These are both on exhibit right now in the Power and Pathos uh, exhibition in Florence at uh, Palazzo Strozzi. And if anybody's over in Italy, go and have a look at this exhibit. There are 53 bronze statues from the Hellenistic period. It's probably half of the extant bronze statues in the world today. And it's the only time they've ever been collected. It's coming to the Getty uh, next year, I think. So you'll have a, a chance to see it more locally. So this is how we know what these statues were because there are, there are several examples of them. And then back to the Antikythera cargo. Here's the Ephib, the youth, the Antikythera youth. It came up in pieces, but they were able to reconstruct it, put it back together. We don't know who it is, a god, a hero. It could be Paris holding the apple of strife, which ultimately launches the Trojan War. Uh, or it could be one of the heroes maybe holding the head of the Medusa, of the Gorgon. And then fragments of many, many more bronze statues. Here's the philosopher. Uh, a beautiful piece. He looks just like the department chair of mine at Woods Hole Oceanographic. <laughs> and I say, hey, Jim, looks just like you. But fragments of them. We start counting up the different fragments that are, that are uh, indicative of separate statues. The feet, for instance. And there are six or eight, at least, more bronze statues waiting in the sediments on the Antikythera shipwreck. So this gets us pretty excited uh, as we think about going back. Here's the arm of a boxer. He's got a boxing glove on. All we have of him is the arm. This is a statue that doesn't have any other uh, examples extant anymore. But in Rome, and now in Florence, there's a statue of another boxer. And this was recovered from, uh, from shore on land. I think it was um, uh, in the palace of uh, Diocletian in Rome. And it was put between two walls and backfilled with sifted sand so that it would be preserved. Maybe when the, the Visigoths or someone was, was uh, marauding and looting and destroying Rome, this one was put aside to be preserved. We talked earlier about art and technology and how they intertwine. This is a prime example. This is one of the reasons I'm so excited about the Antikythera shipwreck. These statues appear green now, but in the day when they were built, they were polychromatic. They use different alloys of copper, of bronze, of different, different metals entirely to, to show all the different things. So this boxer, under his eye, is a bruise in a different, a different alloy of bronze. On his ear, which is all cauliflowered, there are cuts, because he's just come out of this fight, and there are droplets of, pure, of, of blood in pure copper. And he's turned up to look at whoever's approached him. And there are droplets of blood down his right leg, again, in the pure copper alloy. So they must have been incredible when they were on display. Now, bronze statues today are not that common. But in the ancient world, they were very, very common. So Lysippos, one of the famous bronze sculptures uh, in the Hellenistic period, his shop alone made over 1,500 bronze statues. There were thousands of these things on display in the major cities. They're all gone now. They've all been melted down, except for this very few that mostly are on display in Florence, and the ones that are waiting underwater on shipwrecks like Antikythera. Uh, another statue element, again, we don't know which this one came from. We don't have any other warrior, but here's a sword. So the last foreigner that was allowed on the Antikythera shipwreck was Jacques Cousteau in 1976. Back to that notion of archaeology being political, in 76, the Greeks had just thrown out the junta, the, the colonels who had taken over in a, in a coup. And they were reestablishing the, the Hellenic Republic. So they asked Cousteau to come in and make a series of TV shows to promote Greece as a tourist destination. They paid him three or four million drachma to do this. Sort of reminiscent of what's going on now. They invite the American in to explore this shipwreck and promote Greece as a, a stable democracy. Hmm. So Cousteau was there. We feel like we're chasing Cousteau around because those places that he dived in 76, our team has been revisiting over the last several years. So the Cousteau team recovered a whole lot of material, over 200 artifacts, and they were excavating. They were really dredging uh, in an unscientific way from just a couple of square meters on one part of the wreck. But these bronze statuettes came up, and here's a boxer. 
Other things that came up were more bronze, but they were, they were difficult to interpret at first. It turns out they're part of a very, very ornate bed from the first century BC. How do we know that? Because there's an extant example of a very, very similar bed with the exact same kind of bronze decoration in a museum in Switzerland. Nice to have that. Uh, keep that in mind because we found parts of this uh, this past season and modeled it with uh, some of the Autodesk software. Other things that the Cousteau team found, more luxury goods. These beautiful glass bowls, incised glass, these mosaic glass bowls. These are from the Eastern Mediterranean, probably from Syria, the Lebanon area. Uh, and while the technique was known from other examples, the Antikythera shipwreck pushes the date of this technology, this kind of manufacture back by at least a century. So interesting. And then in the same area, these perfume bottles, these unguentaria, would have held, as I said, perfumes or possibly cosmetics or maybe medicines. All of these came from this very small area where they were dredging. And in that same area, beautiful gold jewelry, filigreed gold, gemstones. And right next to it, a skull and jawbone and long bones from a skeleton that's been interpreted as a, a young female. So, this then gets us speculating. What was a female, a very wealthy female, doing on this ship with all this, all this material? Now, our dive officer at Woods Hole Oceanographic says, obviously, it was a rich woman off to be married to a senator in Rome. This is her dowry she's sailing with. It's a beautiful story, and we cannot prove it unless we find the wedding invitation list uh, <laughs> on the wreck. Very, very rare to find human remains. And these are not the only skeletal remains. There are at least four individuals represented and possibly a lot more. Now, one of the things we want to do if we come across more human remains is handle them very, very carefully and then conduct ADNA analysis of them and try to figure out meta-identities. Where were these people from? Uh, certainly, uh, what gender they were? And uh, a whole host of other questions. It's a good time to be uh, underwater archaeologist, I think, as all the other fields are making these great leaps forward that we can just sort of ride the coattails. So what did we do this year? And let's hope that the video plays. Can we have a little bit of sound? Not too loud. There's a score that goes with this. Turn it down a bit. So we had an international team, uh, Greeks, Englishmen, Americans, Chileans, and Australians and Canadians. And we took this autonomous robot here which is from the University of Sydney, the Australian Center for Field Robotics, and we were doing photogrammetry. We had a stereo pair camera on board this AUV. We put it over the side of uh, a yacht that was donated to us by one of our Greek sponsors, the Panos Lascaridi from the Lascaridis Foundation. Uh, not a perfect platform, but really quite suitable, uh, I thought. <laughs> nice to come up from a day of diving and have an espresso put in your hand, or a glass of wine. So we put the robot down on the wreck site as we understood it based on all of the documents that we'd had translated and uh, the journals from 1976. And here's our, our robot Sirius flying over the wreck site. Now you don't see any artifacts on the wreck site because those sponge divers did such a good job in 1901. They really did us a favor. They removed all the big bulky stuff and now we've got just the sediment. And you remember that wrestler, how his right side was so beautiful and his left side was all eroded. Anything that's left on this wreck is gonna be in the sediments and should be very, very well preserved because it's in an anoxic environment. So that means human remains, other organics, the ceramics, uh, all of the luxury goods, the bronze, including possibly the rest of the original mechanism. So what we were doing is at a rate of a slightly faster than one hertz, we were snapping these stereo images over a box of 70 meters by 30 meters uh, dimensions uh, and then piecing these all together in the, in the computer and making a 3D representation or suitable, a, a pseudo 3D representation of the seafloor. This is our base map. Archaeology is certainly a study of artifacts, but archaeological survey has to take into account the spatial relationships among those artifacts. If we had known where the Antikythera mechanism came from, if the sponge divers had made a map, then we could go right back to it with our new technology, with our metal detectors, and we could relocate those bits and fragments. So making a good map is the most important thing. Now what you're seeing here is when things go a little bit wrong. So the wreck site mostly sits at the toe of a steep slope on an uplifted, seismically uplifted terrace. And then there's a shelf break, a vertical wall. 
the robot swam over that shelf break and got hooked on a piece of ghost fishing line. So we had to send the second robot in to effect a rescue. And it was nice to have the other robot because our other option was to suit up a technical diver and put him in the water and go down to 70 meters and uh, save the day. Always better when you can do it with technology. Fortunately, not too badly snagged. And, hey, we rejoice. And on with the mission. So these images, we shot something like 30,000 stereo pairs, put them all together. And the algorithm, algorithm is simultaneous localization and mapping. So it's a slam, uh, a slam algorithm to put this all together and make a pretty map. And you'll see that in just a moment. What you're seeing here is the first couple days of deployment. We were working in September uh, into October. The first couple days were like this, and we thought, great, wonderful. This is an exposed coast, and there's no real lee from the prevailing winds. But very, very quickly, the weather started to come up. Uh, that was troublesome, that was worrisome, but we knew we already had the map in hand, so we weren't completely panicked about it. But here you see the very last day of robotic mapping. Uh, we were out for 23 days. We had five days that were suitable for getting in the water and diving. Uh, so we lost most of our days to, to very, very bad weather. So you're seeing here the end result of that mapping effort. Uh, so like I said, 70 by 30 meters and hyper accurate, one pixel is four millimeters in real space. So we can place our objects very, very accurately, very, very precisely, both. And then bringing that map up to the surface and having us all sit around first on the flat screen and later on a, a very, very large printout that we had made, we could all point and plan our mission, plan our operations. And that proved very, very useful because we had such a short weather window to operate. So we'll move on. I think. So a better look at that map. And so it's a photo mosaic on top, but underneath is the, the wireframe, uh, the underlying mesh, which is really, really quite accurate. So we can do this over a much larger area, certainly. And the total effort here is just, it was just a couple of missions, just a few hours to map in hyper precision. Now, when I started archeology, span it was by scuba diving with tape measures and making these site maps was the thing we all hated. It took up so much of our time and it was dreadfully, dreadfully boring. Now we can do this in a very, very accurate, repeatable way uh, and then get on with the stuff that we like to do and that we're better at than robots right now, which is excavation, fine manipulation of artifacts and thinking. So, <clears throat> and just to give you a, a sense of how bad the weather got, this is the wreck site. Of course, it's always very difficult to tell uh, the scale of ocean waves unless you have something for scale. So. This little red dot is a person, six foot tall man. So we weren't gonna dive that day. This is probably the weather that this ship encountered when it sank. Now to the good stuff. At the northern extremity of the site, we found a lead anchor stock. And here's that anchor stock on our map and we'll switch over to our 4K video. We decided to recover this anchor because we can do lead isotope analysis and figure out where the, the, the lead was mined. Uh, and that's useful because we have many, many lead artifacts from this wreck. If we start to get a, a, a big enough sample, then maybe it will all point to where the ship was originally constructed. So here's Phil Short, Englishman, one of the premier divers in the world. He spent, what was it, 45 days underground in a cave system in Mexico two years ago, uh, diving through different passages and penetrating miles and miles into this cave system. Here's one of the good dive days. Yeah, I, I get really seasick, so it wasn't that much fun a lot of these days. We brought metal detectors down for the first time, and what we really wanted to see was, can we detect degraded bronze that's sitting on the seafloor? Can we detect degraded bronze that's a few centimeters under the seafloor? And can we detect degraded bronze that's very deep under the sediment, maybe 20, 30 centimeters under the sediment? Here is one of the, the other elements from that ornate bed. It was sitting on the surface. We recovered it. 
another piece of that bed, a couple centimeters under the sediment, another, another um, laginose, another one of these table jugs. And here he's holding a bronze ring with a spike and still some wood left on it, part of the ship's original rigging uh, for the running rigging to go through. And here, that bronze spear. And this came from 20 centimeters, 25 centimeters deep under the sediment. A beautiful, beautiful piece. We don't probably have the spear point. We have the butt end, the sorator, the lizard killer. Um, and the, uh, the infantry who were carrying these spears would have embedded that point in the ground if they were to absorb a cavalry charge. Now, who was holding the spear? Was it a warrior? Or could it be Athena, Promachus? Athena, who leads from the front. And that would be great, certainly for, for political benefit in Greece today. But we'll know, we'll know soon. It was like an expectant father waiting for the boat to come in. This was the second to last day. We'd been out for so long and we had so much invested in the project and with the weather so bad, uh, I was getting a little bit nervous about generating some sort of interesting result. So they called me from the boat and they said, Brendan, the divers are on board safely and you should be very happy. And I was. This is my co-PI, my co-chief scientist, Theotokos Theodolou from the uh, Effort of Underwater Antiquities in the Ministry of Culture. This whole project, sure, it's under the aegis of the president of the Hellenic Republic, but it's under the direction of the director of the Division of Underwater Antiquities, Agaliki Samosi. Uh, we've been working together for years. It's a, it's a, it's a good relationship. Uh, in previous years, we'd come across these lead anchor components. Uh, and here's uh, the collar and the stock, and here's how it would have all been put together. Now, the lead's important because of the isotopic analysis, but it's also important for another reason. In the 1960s, there was an American archaeologist named Peter Throckmorton. He was interested in the Antikythera wreck, and he had gone to the museum, he looked at the mechanism, he had looked at all of the stuff that had come from the wreck, and published an article with some other co-authors. And in that article, he had said, it's interesting that no anchors came up. Is it possible that the sponge divers took any lead that they found and used it for their own purposes? They always needed it for their breastplates, for their, their weight belts, for their boots. And if the sponge divers had taken the lead, what else had they taken? Is it possible that instead of fishing in Tunisia, instead of being good sons of Helen, maybe they had recovered other bronze statues and sold them into the black market, maybe in Alexandria? So there was this speculation out there but we can put that to rest. They were patriots and they didn't sell anything in the black market because we've now find, found five lead anchors on this wreck. The problem has been nobody before us has ever had time to investigate. Even the Cousteau team was having 12 minutes of bottom time. We are having 90 minutes of bottom time and we have all the technology to help us. So uh, it's a brand new day on this wreck. Here's one of the anchor stocks that we recovered uh, from this past season. And this is thrown into some of the, uh, the Autodesk software again and modeled. By the way, we, we spoke about um, recovering the past uh, from the, those, those stone carvings. The same thing happened here. That bronze bed element that we recovered, we modeled it uh, in this software. And then as the conservators were handling it, it was so fragile, it just went poof and fragmented. So now the only representation that we have of that artifact is the digital model that, that we made very, very rapidly with the, with the software. So we hope to model everything that comes up uh, from the wreck. <clears throat> I mentioned before about uh, Rome's population uh, growing to a million with the grain ships that were transporting the food in from the Black Sea and from Alexandria. So we're speculating. We have 36 marble statues. We have six or eight bronze statues. How do you pack something that's high value, uh, high volume, but, but low mass into a ship that's going to be in a seaway and have it arrive safely unbroken on the other end. So people have speculated that you'd pack them in sand, but that would be terrible. It would fill up all the limber notches in the hold of your ship and you wouldn't be able to pump out any water. You could crate them up, but then you still got the problem of, of high volume and, and, uh, and, and low mass. What if you packed those statues in a paying dunnage like grain? What if the ship we're looking at is actually one of the ancient grain carriers that plied the route between Rome, Alexandria, and, and the Pontic region. And the evidence is starting to pile up. Uh, the number of anchors we have is not extraordinary, but the size of the anchors that we're beginning to find is extraordinary. The biggest ones we've ever encountered on any shipwreck. 
on the last day of the, of the season, we came across this anchor collar. Typically these things are 70 centimeters long. This one's a meter long, at least. If the collar is a meter long, how big is the stock? And how heavy would that be? It has to be close to a ton. And you're not gonna have a, a, a one ton anchor being lifted onto a small boat. So we have the speculation about the grain as a packing material. We have ship's equipment that starts to look like a massive ship. And then there are other indications too. Uh, the area where Cousteau worked and where we think the statues came from is at the northern extremity where we recovered one anchor stock. 250 meters south, there's another collection of artifacts, which we thought at first might have been a second shipwreck, maybe sailing in consort. But as we look at it, it appears more and more that we're seeing one enormous ship spread over about 250 or 300 meters of shoreline. Evidence saying that this is definitely just a, a shipwreck and not jettisoned stuff is a lead pipe that was part of the water removal system. Uh, here's that other uh, component of the ship itself, which we recovered from the northern extremity, again modeled. So we've got ship parts uh, spread all along here. We know what the waves look like. So surely a big ship could get beaten up and, and debris spread across the entire area of seafloor. And the amphoras uh, that were recovered in 76 and that we recovered in 2012 and that the, the sponge divers recovered in 1901 at both areas are identical. They're the same types. So it all starts to look like it's, it's one ship. And we recovered this, and we'll do ancient DNA analysis of the contents of all of these ceramics. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a brave new world. We just take one of these little swabs and we dip it in lysis buffer, which is a sterile saline solution. We rub the inside of the jar, cap it back up, send it to the lab, make clones, and interrogate those clones, and uh, through PCR, we can tell what was actually being transported. The conventional wisdom's always been that it was wine mostly transported in these jars, but how much wine could the ancients drink? I mean, 90% of the jars carry wine. What, do you have a one commodity economy? What we're seeing in the ADNA is an entirely different picture. We're seeing seven, eight, nine different species mixed together uh, in what could be an ancient meal ready to eat, uh, or it could show multiple use of the jars, which makes a lot of sense too. But we only see wine infrequently. What we're seeing is legumes. We see a lot of olive DNA. Uh, we haven't found any animal proteins yet, but that could be a function of, of how we're going about those, those interrogations. I think what you're, we're really seeing is, is meals ready to eat. We have olive oil as a medium to transport uh, the vegetable matter and, uh, and probably a lot of fish products too. So uh, that's one of the things we've been working on. Uh, we'll take ADNA from this jar. I've got a permit application in right now. We also, this was full of sediment, uh, full of sand from the, from the seafloor. So we sampled that too, and we're gonna look for ancient grain in that sediment inside the jar, phytoliths or grain starches. Uh, and maybe, maybe that will be an indication that this was a grain carrier. And then in this site down south, in addition to the other amphoras and the lead and the anchors, there's stacks of amphoras still in their original loading position, still in their, their tiers as they would have been in the hold of the ship. And then there's wood itself from the hull, recovered by the Cousteau team in 76. They recovered, I think it was four or five planks that were still articulated, mortise and tenon joint. Uh, it's the standard practice for, for that time period. What's different about these planks from any of the other hundreds of vessels that we've looked at is their dimension. These planks are 10 or 11 centimeters thick. That's the size of a 19th century warship plank. Uh, huge, huge, massively built uh, construction here. And the nailing pattern on this uh, shows that uh, the lead sheathing that was applied to the hull was put on at the time of first construction. So again, isotopic analysis of this lead. So what we're looking at is a ship that's got greater dimensions than anything we've seen before. The next closest uh, dimension that's, that's uh, to this ship is the pleasure barges that Caligula built and sailed on Lake Nemi in Italy. And they were nine centimeters thick. And those ships were 200 feet long. So what kind of ship in the ancient world would have had this sort of capital uh, invested in it and had these sort of dimensions? Again, the grain ships. Now these grain ships, they weren't like cargo vessels we think of uh, today. The two written 
uh, the, the two extant references we have to grain ships. One was called the Isis, the other was called the Syracusa. They were 50, 60 meters long, so almost 200 feet long, and they had mosaic floors. They had stables for 21 horses. They had water tanks, fish tanks on board. They had libraries. They had ornate passenger compartments, and these really were the Titanic of the ancient world. So the, the, the elite classes of Rome would get on board these ships, sail down to Alexandria at the beginning of the season, and then they would go on a tourist tour of, of the Holy Land. Uh, uh, wasn't the Holy Land quite yet, but they would tour all around Egypt, and this is when tourism really started. And then at the end of the season, when the ships were loaded up with the grain, everyone would get back on board and sail back to Rome. They'd have 300 passengers on board these things, 300 wealthy passengers. It, it, all, it all starts to tie in with the, the jewelry, this, this female passenger, uh, and all the other evidence. So quite possible that's what we're looking at. And that would be a coup for maritime archaeology. So the ADNA work um, is being done in Sweden by... Uh, by my partner, my wife, Maria Hansen, you see here, she's a molecular biologist. She's just moonlighting with the ADNA stuff for archeology. span Her real job is an environmental toxicologist, uh, but DNA is DNA, so uh, she can do that kind of stuff too. And we're getting close to the end here. In 1900, when the, the sponge divers went back to Athens and reported, the Greek government detailed a Hellenic Navy vessel to go down, actually two steamships to, to help them recover the, uh, the statues and other things. In a nice echo of that, in 2014, we requested Hellenic Navy support for our mission. And they gave us um, one of their salvage vessels, which you'll see in a moment, and also a tugboat, so they could position it, and we could use that as a support ship for the exosuit, for that atmospheric diving system. So some of our other Greek sponsors kicked in uh, to provide helicopter support because it's a very remote place and there aren't any ferry touches through much of the week. So that was uh, really quite, quite useful. And here's that Hellenic Navy vessel, Thetis. A problem we have with this wreck is that it's only 70 meters off the cliff face. So getting a big support ship in uh, to put people down on a lee shore is very, very dangerous. It's very difficult. So this ship could anchor in three, uh, three point anchor and it took us eight attempts before we finally got it relatively close to the site so we could dunk the exosuit and give that system a try. But it was a matter of Greek pride. We trained three Greek Navy uh, petty officers in the exosuit, certified them. The Greek Navy kicked in for us because they're interested in having a submarine rescue capability and they think exosuit may be one avenue toward that goal somewhat elderly ship, but that's exactly the same as it was in 1901. Uh, they had a very, very old ship supporting their operations. So it seems like back to the future. We're hoping for better weather. We go back out in three weeks to do more mapping, to map that entire 300 by 70 meter box now, and probably over that shelf break too, to see what's down there. And we'll have a metal detector on the small ROV, and we wanna produce a heat map of metal detection hits. With that data, that will inform what we do at the end of the summer, in August and September, when we go back for a serious concentrated excavation effort. Uh, we may or may not have exosuit again, uh, the previous owner of it just basically went out of business. And we're trying to arrange a donation of the suit to Woods Hole Oceanographic so we can start to use the thing and develop it as a scientific tool. And just because it, uh, it's so pure, it's just, it's sex on water, that exosuit. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of video of how we put it underwater. Our, our sponsor, Panos Lascarides, who provided the, the yacht Glaros to us, was enthralled with exosuit. He's pushing 70 years old, but he's, he's quite vibrant. And as the weather continued to be bad, 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 and Thetis was waiting for us up in the Peloponnese, uh, the owner of Exosuit offered Panos a dive in it. So they took Glaros out of Antikythera, transited up to the Peloponnese, and they put Panos in Exosuit and dunked him over the side. So he was very, very happy, and uh, it made a, a big splash in the, in the Greek media, of course. Uh, here's a magnate, an adventurer. I'll mention, too, uh, 
One of our primary sponsors is the Swiss luxury watchmaker Hublot. They were our official timekeeper and they provided dive watches to the whole dive team. And the funny little story there is the watches are uh, about $30,000 a piece. And so Matthias Boutet, the director of R&D from Hublot, choppered in, met us at the yacht, and handed out the watches to the dive team. They all thought, oh, that's very, very nice. We'll have to return them at the end of the project, right? And, oh, no, no, these are yours to keep. Oh, that's a pretty good bonus. And I was trying to take credit for that. But then the next day, the divers went in the water and I was looking at the images. I said, hey, where are your watches? And they said, well, we're not gonna wear a $30,000 watch in the water. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Let's make sure we get pictures because Hublot wants to use that as their, as their marketing. So in Basel, I don't know if anyone here is a, is a horologist or, or a watch fan, but I was at Basel World last year because Hublot has embraced the Antikythera project long term, and they used a lot of this same video uh, in their booth at, at Basel World this year. So it's a, it's a great relationship and uh, <laughs> wonderful sponsors. Hublot also sponsored the Antikythera shipwreck exhibit at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, the one where Michael Wright's other model is currently sitting. Antikythera, it has a draw. You're all here today because of it. The National Archaeological Museum in Athens, of course, has hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. When they brought the temporary exhibit for the Antikythera shipwreck to that, to that museum, they increased their gate 84% over a year. So there's a huge appetite for this in, in the world. So I'll leave you with one, one final thought. If you just think about how many ships must have been in the ancient fleet in the Mediterranean at any one point, and how many voyages they must have sailed, and what the loss rate must have been, there's gotta be three quarters of a million ancient shipwrecks sitting out there on the seafloor of the Mediterranean. We're proving right now that you can take our technology and survey entire ocean basins. They're doing it for the missing Malaysian airliner MH370. What if we did that in the Aegean? What if we did that in the entire Mediterranean? Antikythera so far is the most extraordinary shipwreck we've ever found, but it can't be the only one out there that's that interesting. So over the next 20 years, with help from friends like Autodesk and Hugh Blow and others, that's the goal. We want to find every shipwreck that's out there and find the ones that are the most interesting and extract as much information as rapidly as possible from them and come up with a new picture of how civilization started, the origins of the modern world. They're waiting for us out there. We just got to get out and get on the water. Thanks for your attention. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, Tatiana, Nick, Michael, come up. We've got by my, um, it's not a new blow. Um, <laughs> I can hook you up. It's a fake Chinese panorama. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for general q and I've got a few on cards which we can try and I can take a couple more cards from you gentlemen here. Come, put it on the top of the pile. My arms are not that long. Are we sitting? Yes, please sit. Oh, okay. What a fantastic day this has been. I can't believe it. First of all, while I fumble through the cards, any of you have any unresolved issues you need to work out quickly? No. <laughs> Good. Amazed. Yeah, it was amazing. I know what you're referring to, and I'm not going to take the bait. <laughs> These are hard to sort in real time. Um, well, here's one from Michael Wright. Why don't we start back at the beginning? Elaborate on the tools that might have been used to build that device. You said you could carry things in your pocket. What, what do you think they used? The main things you need are simple tools for cutting brass sheet. Most of the parts seem to have been made out of prepared sheet. Uh, perhaps we won't talk about how you prepare the sheet at this moment. Uh, but I'm guessing that was a com commercial product you could obtain. Uh, the, the sheet's fairly uniform in thickness. Um, in English measure, it's about a sixteenth of an inch, um, or was originally. And that's about the thickness I've used in my model, uh, both my models. Uh, the, so what would you need? No hacksaw in the ancient world. That seems to be an invention of the, uh, the Renaissance. 
and uh, specifically a tool for cutting screws holding up bits of armour together because screws were newfangled then, so no screws in the original either. Um, the, uh, so you'd cut your sheet using a hammer and chisel working on a bolster and it would then have to be filed up. We've got lots of examples of Roman files <clears throat> and they'd be much the same. Uh, they're often hard to recognise because they look like a stick of rust. Um, but, uh, no, uh, people say, but did they have steel? Of course they had steel. Uh, they wouldn't have understood what it was. Nobody understood, really, the relationship between steel and iron until the 18th century. Um, but uh, uh, steel, there certainly was, and that, that's what the files would have been made of. Uh, so you need hammer and chisel, some files, uh, something to scrape the metal flat. You might use a metal scraper. You might stone it flat using a piece of stone as an abrasive. Um, those are the main tools. Oh, for setting out, you'd need a rule and compasses and a scriber. Um, I have an extension of that question that's more of an autodesk question. Uh, could the mechanism be made out of molded plastic to allow hobbyists to build one for themselves? And I would reinterpret that as saying, how soon before you can scan in everything that Michael's done, begin printing it out for us so that we can play around with it? Well. Which laptop? Oh, you've got it. <laughs> but uh, any plans yet from Autodesk to scan in these sorts of well, artifacts? If I assess well the mechanism, it is fairly easy to make it without much scanning or software because it's really almost two-dimensional sheets of metal that are just cut. So it's easy to make today with any maker can make it just out of um, uh, sheet metal so and sounds like a Michael simple CAD drawing. The, I, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, have you finished? Yes. Uh, two things. There are some uh, th components which have th a third dimension to them, and many of those are pieces of sheet that's been bent up. That tells us a lot about the alloy that was used, incidentally, and the metallurgical state it was in. It wasn't that hard and brittle. Um, the, uh, the other thing I was going to say, more important about modeling in a, a material that may scuff more readily than bronze, mm -hmm. Uh, and that is that the, uh, the local pressures between some of the gear wheels would, uh, is quite high. Now, I haven't model, made my model in bronze for several reasons. One, uh, but one big one is that I had plenty of bits of sheet brass in the scrap box. And uh, the brass looks pretty much the same as the bronze would, and it behaves much the same way as a low tin bronze. Um, if anything, though, my brass is a little softer um, a little more yielding uh, than, uh, than a bronze would have been. And so in building my model out of brass, I'm disadvantaging myself. But my experience is, I mentioned in passing earlier, a design blunder in the original. It's in the step-up gearing driving the moon pointer. The, the moon pointer goes round the front dial over 13 times as fast as the sun pointer because we're talking of the number of tropical months in the year, and um, not, not synodic months. And the, um, that, that step-up train is a nightmare with primitive gear teeth. It's easy enough to make a reduction gear train work fairly sweetly with crude gear teeth, not so a, a, um, a step-up train. And in my model, which probably has better cut gears than many I see in the original, um, the more evenly cut, uh, I've had to replace some of the gear wheels seven, eight, nine times. And they're all gear wheels in that step-up train. Somewhere amongst my, the extra slides I didn't show you, I've got a rogues gallery of all the wrecked gear wheels that I've taken out of it over the years. Uh, that's, uh, in, that part of the model was built in the winter of 2001, and uh, so it's had that many years of only very occasional use. Now, I don't suppose uh, it's going to be very easy to copy the design exactly into a plastic that is going to stand very well, though maybe a self-lubricating loaded plastic would do all right. Well, it sounds like if you spend an afternoon at Pier 9 with Autodesk in San Francisco, you'll have it all worked out. Um, uh, and he could have 
simulated it and analyzed it in different materials to see that some will fail and some will work. Yeah, you exchange business <laughs> cards. Um, <laughs> the next time we will save you some time. <laughs> so there are, there are a number of questions having to do with um, wondering about other uh, advanced mechanical innovations of the day. Uh, you know, I think back to Archimedes, you give me a lever long enough I could move the world, but presumably you also use it for defense purposes to yank boats out of the water, correct? Um, Nick, this might be partly for you, it might be partly for Michael, but what other um, sort of known or uh, mythologized innovations were there back in the day? And. Um Cranes. You know, cranes, for example, Archimedes was, people say, from what we read, that he could lift ships. And he would say to his king in Syracuse that if you could, st if you could stand on a big rock, he had a huge iron uh, mechanism, he could lift the earth if he would be, you know, Right. Off the, so it's, you know, there are all these kind of stories of amazing mechanisms, but we don't have evidence. And as I said earlier, uh, when I first came to the country and people were telling me ancient Greeks had no gears, you can't imagine how sleepless I became when the mechanism came up. I said, yeah, they did have gears. <laughs> so, you, you know, you see, for example, the musical organ that has exactly what we have in cars, pistons, valves, and so on. So uh, you know, I can send you a precise uh, analysis of that musical organ by a very well-known mechanical engineer who's a professor in the University of California. Michael. I've nothing to disagree with over what Nikos has said, uh, but I'll add a little. Um, the, we have nothing, although we, we know of various other things, relatively little survives, probably because the instruments in question weren't lost in deep water to be recovered in modern times. Uh, that's our great fortune, that the mechanism was lost out of reach of the scrap metal man. Second piece of good fortune, it was got up again. Third piece of good fortune is it was recognized. You need all three. Um, but of the other items we know of, even if we don't have much of them, uh, none is so intricate uh, as, uh, as the Antikythera mechanism. That really gives us a much clearer idea of the capability of the Hellenistic mechanic than uh, the catapult or the crane or, uh, and such items, which were mostly made like, a, like an old-fashioned bedstead. Uh, as indeed was the 18th century steam engine. Most of it's wood with just as few metal parts as you can get away with. Here we have something rather different. Um, the other, another object that existed in the ancient world that uh, Nikos hasn't mentioned is the water clock. Um, the, uh, but these were relatively simple devices. Um, the, one of the earliest good records of, early te of Hellenistic technology we have is actually the uh, Latin, uh, the Roman author Vitruvius writing about uh, uh, his book called De Architectura, but uh, his 10th book, the 10th uh, of the 10 books of De Architectura, uh, lists a number of machines. And um, OK, are they Roman? Are they Greek? Well, the answer is, is clear when you read the original, because um, Vitruvius is Latin. Whenever he gives the name of a gadget, more often than not, it's a, a Latinized version of a Greek name or a wreck of a Greek name. If he gives the name of an inventor, as he often tries to do, it's usually a Greek name too. Um, so this is a good record of Hellenistic uh, technical achievement. But as I mentioned, the Antikythera mechanism trumps all the other things that we know about. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's the most sophisticated. Uh, I have one more line of questioning that's a little bit more for Michael, and then maybe we'll pull forward into the shipwreck. You mentioned. Um, other ancient writers. It, now, it turns out you happen to read ancient Greek, correct? Stroke Slowly. of luck. Yeah, um, just because. Um, I read somewhere that the Roman writer Cicero had seen Antikythera-like devices in Rome. Is that true? What do we know about that? There's a well-known um, passage in uh, 
Cicero, I call him Cicero, yeah. but we, we're talking to the same man yeah. uh, uh, in his book, The De Republica, um, which is modelled on Plato's Republic. Um, it was written oh, somewhere in the 50s BC, first written in 54, revised in 51, uh, but which is, is very close in time to the Antikythera wreck, if you think about it. The wreck went down during Cicero's lifetime, as far as we can see. But this is a curious passage. It's a reconstruction it's, uh, of uh, an historic conversation uh, which took place several generations earlier, I'm forgetting dates, which then in the conversation, one of the speakers harks back to an earlier still occurrence, which gets us back to about 169 BC, I think. Uh, and he de describes a device which is said to be um, a, a, a planetarium gadget that ca came from Syracuse when it was sacked in 212 BC uh, and said to have been made by or designed by Archimedes. Um, it's very doubtful whether Cicero actually saw this, this instrument. What he seems, to cut the long story short, if I, sh I think I should, uh, what he seems to be describing is an instrument he has seen himself. We know that he studied, as all posh Romans did with a Greek tutor, in Rhodes. He studied with a man called Posidonius. And elsewhere, he mentions that Posidonius, who had an interest in astronomy, had such a gadget himself. And it's almost certain in my mind, but unprovable, that the thing he describes as having come from Syracuse is actually the thing that he'd seen with his tutor Posidonius somewhere around 70, 80 BC. Uh, in other words, quite close in time to the Antikythera shipwreck. But there is no doubt in my mind it was different. I brought, it to, I brought my reconstruction of it to the EG last yes, year. I remember. And if you look at, if you, if you trawl the internet and find the presentations at last year's EG, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is it's, the sphere of Archimedes. It's a thing uh, like a celestial globe with, with some gearing and ga gadgetry inside so the pointers on the outside show the places of the planets as you roll the globe day by day. And uh, so we do, uh, would you conclude that this kind of technology was um, uh, prominent in Archimedes' school, if you will, in his workshop? Hesitate to agree with, uh, with prominent. Mm -hmm. We just don't know the numbers. But it's perfectly clear that this instrument was built by somebody who knew exactly what he was doing. He may have made mistakes, but he hasn't done anything and then changed his mind about it as far as I can see clearly. He hasn't done what the Renaissance or early modern clockmaker often did with a, with a special commission, which is to try something, find it didn't work, uh, take that apart, leaving empty holes and try something different. There's nothing like that I see in, in the wreck of the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, what is more, it's perfectly clear that whoever made it either had prior experience of making such things himself or had studied earlier things made by someone else. In other words, we're looking at a tradition that goes back at least a generation. This but person sounds a lot like... Uh, this brings the comment that it could be a microphone? commercial product. <laughs> it could be a commercial product, and we have found only one. It could be a commercial product, although to me it sounds like there was a character very much like Michael Wright wandering around in 65 <laughs> BC pulling these things together, which is a scary thought. Um, a couple of... Uh, There's maybe competitive products. True. <laughs> okay. I would guess there would be a number of them, and each one would be individual. Yes. That's, the no, way, no, that's no, the way the... Craftsman working, the workman go, making things one at a time tends to be, he'll want to try a different idea next time, or his client wants something a little bit different. He wants something better than his neighbor next door has. That's Greeks. <laughs> They're going to be very different from other Greeks. A couple of expeditionary questions, Brandon. These are a little bit like layups, but they have to do with security. Um, how do you secure the site when you're not there? I guess nobody else is there. But. Yeah, this is, a, this is an issue. Uh, the, the technical diving gear that we're using is widely available now. Uh, Jonathan Knowles is diving with a rebreather, and that's, that's what we're using. The site is, is fairly deep, but not crazy deep. It's in an inhospitable place, but there are spear fishermen there all the time. In fact, we found a spear on the, on the wreck, not a bronze spear, a spear gun spear. 
One of our sponsors in Greece is Ote Cosmote. It's, it's the Greek AT&T. And they set up dedicated uh, mobile phone towers in two locations for us, one of which is right over the rec site. And we've been in conversation with them. I'm trying to back away from this and get the Ministry of Culture and Ote Cosmote uh, to discuss directly how we can put up at least a monitoring system. But we run into a whole host of, of problems there. Uh, it's a diesel power generator that's running the, uh, the, the, the base station there. So they have to pay someone to go there and service the thing. We put cameras on board on, on the, uh, the mast, and that's fine. We'll be able to see if anybody is there. But do we want an interdiction capability? And if so, then we have to telemeter data real time back to somebody who's gonna monitor it or automate it somehow. And now we're getting to some really complicated issues and expensive issues. So it's a, it's a bit of a concern. Right now, we're just keeping the location uh, as quiet as we can. And how about uh, while you're there, how do you prevent damage to the site? For instance, just dropping an anchor could punch a hole in something. What do you do? Yeah, that's true. Uh, we, we set up moorings. We had our divers drop over the side of the boat with uh, chains and straps and mooring lines and, and place moorings so the boats could come in and not drop, drop any anchors. Uh, we kept Thetis well off the shelf break so that it wasn't gonna drop a, an anchor right into it. Uh, but these are all real concerns, yeah. And maybe one last question uh, as we wrap up. So as you go forward with the expedition, what, um, what kind of technological wishes do you have that aren't yet addressed? I mean, what, what fantasies do you have of things you need that, that the world should be inventing for you? Well, this, is, this was one of the fun things of this project. Uh, we got the team together, and it's a really interesting group of people. And I said, okay, don't let budget constrain your thinking. How would each of you approach this site? How would you extract as most, the most information from it uh, as possible? How would you do it safely? And everybody in their, in their different uh, field had, had ideas on how to do this. So the divers said, well, it's crazy for us to be on rebreathers. We ought to go into saturation diving. We ought to have a habitat on site like, like they used to have uh, uh, down in the Florida Keys. And then we'd be able to work eight hour days. We didn't have to worry about it. Well, we could do that, but the price tag more than doubles. Uh, I think the autonomous vehicles are great. I'd like to have a sub-bottom profiling sonar that's of the right frequency and, and beam width to be able to interrogate that sedimented, uplifted terrace. Uh, but multipath deconvolution is a really difficult problem when you're, when you're sending sound waves into a very complex acoustic environment like a shipwreck. So uh, we'd have to have a whole lot of maths. What we basically need is acoustic tomography. Uh, on the shipwreck site. For a wreck like this, we could do it. We could put uh, hydrophones all around it and a sound source maybe on, a, on some sort of vehicle system and, and keep interrogating. But it's a development project. And, and right now, the Greek government is breathing down my neck saying, enough with the science, dig, dig. <laughs> Start digging. OK, great. Well, I should leave you to your digging. And on that note, you've been a wonderful audience. I can't thank you enough. What a fantastic day. Thank you, John Holler and the museum. Thank you to the panelists. Terrific.